So we see when we look at the story of Abraham, we can see those four elements of faith, pistis, that I mentioned in an earlier session. Number one, Abraham heard God. Number two, he believed God. Number three, he confessed God's promise. And number four, he acted on God's promise. So we can see these things one by one. He heard God's word in several different ways. In close fellowship, he heard God's word. The Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. In that time when God spoke to him, it was out of close fellowship he heard God's word. He heard God's word in visions. Genesis 15 verse 1, it says there that the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. He also heard God's word when God spoke to him in some physical form. We don't quite know how it was, but when Abraham was 99 years old, it tells us in Genesis 17, verse 1, that the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God. How did he appear? We don't know. Seems to be some real clear appearance of God. Then he also spoke to God through angelic messengers. Genesis chapter 22. The angel of the Lord called to him, verse 11. The angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So God spoke to him. He heard God's word. He also confessed his faith in God. He called upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 12, verse 8. Make a note of that scripture. Genesis 12 and verse 8. He called upon him as Yahweh, verse 8 of Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 21, 33. He called upon him as the eternal God. Genesis 14, 22. The most high God. The God of heaven and earth in Genesis 14, 22 as well. Called upon him as the Lord in chapter 15 and verse 2. The judge of all mankind in chapter 18 and verse 25. The just God, Genesis 18, 25. The provider, as I just said, Jehovah Jireh, Genesis 22 and verse 8. We see number three that Abraham trusted God. He worshipped God and called him by name. He believed in the Lord. He acted in his faith, number four. He left Ur of the Chaldees. He left Haran. He adopted a nomadic way of life, even when God had promised Canaan to him. He lived by faith. He was ready to sacrifice Isaac. All these things demonstrated that he was a man of faith, and he obeyed God in his faith, and his responses were responses to revelation. So we acknowledge that Abraham is a very clear example of a believer. In Genesis 15, verse 6, we see a verse which is very heavily quoted in the New Testament and is the basis of Paul's teaching and understanding of, of justification by faith. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. It was Abraham's faith, not his good behavior or his obedience to any law. This was hundreds of years even before the law had been revealed. It was Abraham's faith which resulted in him being reckoned as righteous by God. And that's a foundation principle of all biblical faith. And so we see the New Testament builds on this foundation of faith. In the Gospels, we find the call is constantly that we should commit ourselves to Christ, to Jesus, to believe. And in fact, Jesus' first words in his public preaching were, repent and believe, Mark 1, verse 15. Mark 1, verse 15. So we, we find here the, the importance of faith to those who are living the New Testament life. Because God's kingdom has come. Faith is required to lay hold of that. This kind of faith calls for a change a change in the way we think about God, repentance, and to commit ourselves wholeheartedly to everything that Jesus stands for. That's faith. To this whole mission. To believe in the gospel means to believe and to commit ourselves to Jesus himself. Now, when Jesus ministered in the gospels, he constantly challenged people to believe. And uh, this is so important because I believe he's doing the same thing today. His major call upon our life is that we should believe him. The whole of the Bible is an appeal for us to believe him. So straight after 
he made this first public declaration, Mark 1, 15. He uh, called his disciples to leave everything, to follow him. This is a challenge of faith. The faith aspect is always strong in the healings. I know this is disputed today. Those who are against faith teaching and against the faith movement play down the element. And I understand why they want to, because, you see, they want to protect those people who've been told that they've not been healed because of their unbelief. But what about those people who have not been healed because of their unbelief? We need to be balanced here the other way as well. Now, I'm not suggesting that people who are not healed, it's always because of their unbelief. Often, we can point to people who are believing God with all of their heart. And it's not any lack in their faith. And there is an element of mystery here. We don't understand it, but we do know this. is a healing God, and we keep on believing Him. That's the end of the story. He cannot break His word. That's the end of the story. No, when we go to the New Testament, we find Jesus constantly calling people to believe. Or the people who came and were healed did have faith, acknowledging that faith is the operation of God. We still believe that. But remember in Matthew 8, verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to the, those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. He was speaking about the centurion who said to Jesus, don't bother even to come home with me, just speak the word and my servant is going to be healed. That's great faith. Jesus is commending him for his great faith and he is requiring faith from people. Where is your faith? He is saying uh, to people. And he says to others who are healed, according to your faith, be it to you. Mark 10, 52. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Oh yes, faith is important in the element of healing. We also find that Jesus rebukes his disciples for unbelief. Now I don't think that he is bringing condemnation on them. I think sometimes he's smiling. He's saying, come on, where is your faith? Now look at the stilling of the storm in Matthew 8 verse 26. Uh, they were panicking. Jesus was asleep. They were about to sink. They were about to drown. They were about to perish. Everything was going. Everything was collapsing. Everything was falling. Everybody know, anybody know that feeling? Help! And then Jesus is sleeping. He seems to be oblivious to everything. Don't you care what's happening to me, Lord? What's going on? The storm is about to sink me and my boat. Don't you care that we perish? And Jesus said to them, Oh, why are you so fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Then he arose, stood at the edge of the boat. He rebuked the winds of the, and the sea. Peace, be still. And then there was a great calm. He is constantly encouraging us to grow in faith and to trust him to see remarkable things. And again, all the remarkable achievements we read in healing and many things come because of faith. And there are many scriptures which we'll be coming back to, of course, they are there in the manual for you. But I'd like you to look at Mark 9, verse 23, because that's a very special verse. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, you know what's happening here. Here is a man who brought his son to be healed, uh, deaf, the deaf and dumb spirit. And the, Jesus was away up the mountain. The disciples couldn't heal the boy. And so this man's faith is at a low ebb. He said, I brought my boy for, to your disciples to be healed, and they couldn't heal him. Can you do anything? If you can, then please do. And Jesus replies in a remarkable way. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, you must understand that the word for possible is, is the word being able. Being able. So if it's possible for God, he is able. So when the man said to Jesus, if you can, he was saying, if this is possible. 
if this is possible to you? And Jesus replies, possible to me? Like, do you know who I am? But then he swings it right round and he says, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man understood this was a challenge to his faith. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now, we, we know that. We know that in our experience. How many people are full of faith here today? Nobody wants to lift their hands. Swing those cameras around. Let the whole world see how many believers we have here in the Sword of the Spirit session on living faith. How many people believe? Okay. We also know the other side. Help my unbelief, don't we? And there's a way of doing that. Shall I tell you? I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to know what to believe and what to doubt. Believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts. That's how it helps your unbelief. You've got to know what to believe. You believe your beliefs. You've got to know what not to believe. And that's your unbeliefs. Okay. So here, Jesus makes it clear that all things are possible in the face of the most outrageous impossibilities. And in that, he is saying, by faith, you can see the assertion of substance over appearance. Hallelujah. Whatever you're believing, for God, believing God for now, if you're believing God for it, it's substance. I know it's substance. You say, well, I have it. If you have it, you don't need to believe for it. I don't need to believe for this clock. I need to obey it. But I don't need to believe for it. It's here on the podium for me. But if I didn't have it, I might need to believe for it. So God says, by faith, your substance, that which you're believing for, the Spirit's reality, will be manifest over and against the appearance. Divine truth can win over human facts. All things are possible. All things are possible. By faith to him who believes, to those who believe. And so the, the, the Gospels are so full of the call for faith and Jesus' demand for faith and to trust in him and to obey him and to believe his word, to receive his word. Luke 8, 11 to 15, the power of the sower equates believing with receiving the word of God. Now, in John's Gospel... The teaching on faith is developed in a very special direction. I've touched on this in, in an earlier session, and you also have it for you in your manuals. We remember that uh, in John's Gospel, the verb to believe appears almost a hundred times. And in John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, John says why he's writing the Gospel. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of, these, of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the whole purpose of John's Gospel, that we might believe. That's the whole purpose of any Gospel. That's the whole purpose of the Gospel. And so, we have a little study there in the study guide for you of how in John's Gospel he builds on this topic of faith, hearing the word, believing in Jesus, faith being prompted by Jesus' works, and salvation itself coming as, an act of, uh, as a result of faith. And so faith is so central to John's teaching. When we look through those scriptures, you see that it involves a radical transformation of life and a total renunciation of the world. On one occasion, great crowds were following him. And Jesus realized, it was after the feeding of the 5,000, he realized that they were going to make him king. He was so popular, so he decided he better start making himself a bit more unpopular. And so he said, you're only, you're only here for the bread. And they said, well, our fathers gave us 
manna in the wilderness, what bread are you going to give? In other words, do another miracle. Do another miracle. We want to see another miracle. Our fathers saw manna, what are you going to do? So he said, you've got to understand, the bread that I'm giving is my flesh. And you've got to eat my flesh. You're hungry? Who's going to eat my flesh? You're hungry? And more than that, you've got to drink my blood. <laughs> That's how to become unpopular, all right. Don't forget, Jesus is talking to Jews. Drinking blood is repulsive to most cultures. But to the Jewish culture, the Jewish law, it's forbidden. And Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. Now what is he doing? He is lifting them out of the world, of the realm of sense data, into the realm of faith. You've got to understand, I'm not here to give you physical food. I'm here to give you spiritual food. I'm here to give you eternal life. He that believes in me has crossed from death to life. So it's all about faith. It's all about believing. And so John speaks about how we should live and abide and keep on believing and lay hold of him in faith. Now, moving on in the New Testament, we come to the book of Acts. And uh, it's very important to, to grasp this from, from the New Testament. The book of Acts is specifically... Uh, sorry, the, the Gospels are specifically talking about faith in Jesus. The book of Acts begins to see how that faith was experienced in early church life and in the growth and development of, of the Christian church. Now, we notice straight away when we go to the book of Acts that those who were in the Christian community, those who believed the Gospel, who followed the Gospel, were called believers, those who believe. Acts 2 to 44. Now all who believed were together. So throughout the book of Acts, the exercise of faith is shown to be the essential accompaniment to repentance. It's always faith in the Lord or faith in the word that was preached about him. And that's one thing we know from the early Christians. They were believers, not make-believers. I, I don't want to overemphasize this because we have much other teaching to cover and I don't have the time to do it, but I, I can't resist pausing at this moment and making this point. Where are, have all the believers gone? You see, getting back to that earlier point that I made in another session about notional faith. It seems that Western Christians have only a cerebral, mental, intellectual faith. But Jesus wants us to have a real faith. Let me just give you an example. Don't lift your hands, but I wonder how many hands will be raised if I said, how many people believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead? I don't think anybody would refuse to lift their hand. But I would come back and challenge both you and me and say, do we really believe it? Or is it just something in our mind? Because if we really believe Jesus was Lord, why do we do what we're doing? How could we ever say, no, Lord, if we believed that he is Lord? 